Thank you very much for the invitation of the Catholic University of Korea into the capital city of Seoul. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in the following I am going to present a highly abbreviated version of my contribution to our symposium. The first part deals with different models for the relationship between natural sciences and creation theology. The second part explains the negative character of the monotheistic concept of creatio ex nihilo and its relevance for the freedom of God's creative activity. Finally, the third part underlines the difference between creatio ex nihilo and the Big Bang, respectively physical speculations about what the Big Bang is based on. In, his, in the preface of the third volume of his Church Dogmatics on the Doctrine of Creation, Karl Barth, one of the most important theologians of the 20th century, writes, quote, it will perhaps be asked in criticism why I have not tackled the obvious scientific question posed in this context. It was my original belief that this would be necessary, but I later saw that there can be no scientific problems, objections or aids in relation to what Holy Scripture and the Christian Church understand by the divine work of creation. There is free scope for natural science beyond what theology describes as the work of the Creator. And theology can and must move freely where science, which really is science and not secretly a pagan gnosis or religion, has its appointed limit." End of quote. Bart, uh, Bart addresses in his doctrine of creation neither the development of modern physics nor the theory of evolution in the third volume of his Church Dogmatics. Bart's doctrine of creation has been associated with the model of separation of theology and science. Barth's approach to the positivity of revelation and theology as a dormant doctrine of faith has been most influential in Protestant theology. In the Anglo-American sphere, it is referred to as neo-orthodox. The problem with Barth's approach is that it is no longer clear how a belief in creation can refer to the same world as that described by the sciences. Wolfert Pannenberg therefore believes that Barth's assertion that the world of God's creation becomes an empty formula. Karl Reiner maintains that natural science and theology cannot come into conflict with each other because they differ from, out, from the outset, both in the object area and in the methods. According to Rana, conflicts between science and theology can only arise when natural sciences and theology cross borders. In contrast to Barth's model of theological restriction, Rana's model is the model of a peaceful coexistence. After the great historical conflicts of, of, over the Copernican system and the theory of evolution, a ceasefire or peace agreement had been reached in the relationship between theology and natural sciences. In contrast to Barth and Rana, Pannenberg presents a model of consonance between belief in creation and science, a view shared by the physicist and theologian John Polkinghorn. The model of consonance does not mean that the theology has any competence in scientific description and theory formation. Theology moves on a different level than the natural sciences. For example, theology has a different understanding of space and time than modern physics. However, Pannenberg holds that there is neither indifference nor competition between the scientific description and the belief in creation, but rather a relationship of consonance. Since neither the two approaches can be directly related to each other, this can only be justified by recourse to philosophy as a third level. 
In this level, there is necessarily an interrelationship between science and theology in which the disciplines enter into conversation with one another. Without philosophy, such a conversation would not be possible. Pannenberg illustrates this with topics that are generally regarded as central to conversation of science and theology, such as the laws of nature and contingency, space and time, evolution and spirit. A historical example of the is an important historical example is the dialogue between science and theology um, is the correspondence between Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz and Samuel Clark about Isaac Newton's designation of space as the sensorium Dei, where philosophy no longer asked the last question, traditionally called the metaphysical questions, physicists partly fill this gap. Second part, the monotheistic concept of creatio ex nihilo. Christian apologists of the second century, like Tatian and Theophilus of Antioch, see the creation out of nothing as the consequence of biblical monotheism. If matter, they argued, had existed from eternity, it would be like God, without origin. God's creative activity would have been limited to the matter that already existed and would therefore not be absolutely unconditional. But rather, there would have been a restriction on the creative power of the divine word. Since Irenaeus of Lyon, the doctrine of creation, creatio ex nihilo, has been part of the foundation of Christian monotheism. Already Augustine emphasized that creatio ex nihilo alone means that God neither creates from something given nor creates from his nature and substance. The nothing cannot have any kind of power because otherwise it is already something and no longer nothing. Anselm of Canterbury in his analysis of the idea of creatio ex nihilo makes it clear that the nihil exclusively states that creation before it come into being was not, and was not created with the help of something already given as the material cause, whatever it may be. The nihil is a negation of fundamental nature. The creatio ex nihilo denotes an act sui generis without a real analogy because God's creative activity presupposes nothing but his existence. Bonaventura could, <clears throat> Bonaventura could therefore say that the nihil is not to be understood materialiter, but originaliter, so that it does not denote what the creation was made of, but is an indication of its origin. That creation has its origin in God's freedom. This has a significant impact on the concept of monotheism as outlined in Anselm's controversial ontological argument for the existence of God. According to Anselm, we, uh, we understand God to be aliquid, quo nihil maius cogitari possit. In chapter 5 of the Proslogion, Anselm understands the creatio ex nihilo to be a part of the aliquid, quo nihil maius cogitari possit, in relation to the world. Quote, so what are you, Lord God, above whom nothing greater can be thought? End of quote. Anselm's answer is, quote, but what are you if not that which is the highest of all, existing by itself alone, has created everything else out of nothing? Because everything that is not is less than what you can imagine, end of quote. Anselm thus claims that his definition of God can only apply to the creator ex nihilo. For the North American philosopher Robert Sokolowski, it follows that God and the world together 
are not greater than God alone without the world. Already in the foreword of the Proslogion, Anselm points out that God is the highest good that needs no other and that everything needs to be. And towards the end of the Proslogion, Anselm writes that God, beyond whom nothing greater cannot be thought, would in no way be less if all things, quote, would return to nothing, end of quote. Accordingly, there is a fundamental difference between a God who is creator ex nihilo and a God who is part of a necessary existing whole, as is, in the, is the case for, a, for the Aristotelian God. The one God who is the creator of heaven and earth is more than the principle of movement and would still exist even if the world does not. Third part, creation from nothing at the Big Bang. In his premature enthusiasm, Pius XII wanted to see the Big Bang model as a kind of proof for the existence of God. In a speech to members of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, the pontiff said, quote, it seems that modern science, by ingenious recourse to millions of centuries, had somehow succeeded in witnessing the let there be light at the original beginning, when matter come, uh, came into being and a sea of light and radiation broke out of it, thus the creation in time, hence a creator, God therefore exists." End of quote. The Belgian theologian and physicist Georges Lemaitre who is regarded as the father of the Big Bang model, or theory, recalled that when he tried to explain his model of an expanding universe to Albert Einstein in the early 1930s, Einstein stopped him with the remark, quote, no, not that, it smells too much of creation, end of quote. But Einstein makes the mistake to identify the beginning with creation. Unlike Pius XII, Lemaitre, who was a member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, saw no proof of God in the Big Bang theory. Lemaitre said that one can defend the theory completely independently of religious convictions. Quote, as far as I can judge, this theory remains completely beyond all metaphysical and religious questions. It gives the materialists the freedom to deny the existence of any transcendent being. For the believing person, it is compatible with the word of Isaiah of the hidden God, hidden even at the beginning of creation. But I'm not saying that cosmology has no meaning for philosophy. End of quote. According to the Big Bang model, time and space have a beginning because they cease to exist behind the Big Bang. The Planck time and the Planck length forms the limits of physics known to us. The physicist Paul Davis writes, quote, people often ask, where did the Big Bang occur? The Big Bang did not occur at a point in space at all. Space itself came into existence with the Big Bang. There is similar difficulty over the question, what happened before the Big Bang? The answer is, there was no before. Time itself began at the Big Bang." End of quote. Because the singularity of the Big Bang is not nothing, it cannot be identical with the Creatio ex nihilo. Nothingness is not an object of physics, which presupposes time and space with the possibility of its measurement. The fact that physics cannot make empirically verifiable statements for the time before the Planck period is due to its method. What Immanuel Kant uh, said about physics is still true today. Physics only refers to phenomena, even if they are only indirectly detectable 
like a quantum fluctuation. Kant's thing in itself is as little a concept of physics as God or nothingness. However, there are physicists who say that the universe originated from nothing. The most famous of them was Stephen Hawking. Among the German physicists, Harald Fritsch, like Hawking, author of popular science books, should be mentioned. In his book, From the Big Bang to the Decay, he writes, in his book, From the Big Bang to Decay, Fritsch writes, quote, everything originated from nothing. First, a very hot plasma of quarks, electrons, and other particles, together with space and time, end of quote. If this is to be a physical proposition, the nothing here cannot have the same meaning as in the thought of the Creatio Nihilo. Physical nothing is a concept of the quantum vacuum and field theory or something else, for example, a kind of black hole related to the state before the Big Bang. The question of the beginning in physics is different from the question of the origin as it is exposed in philosophy and theology. The question of contingency cannot be answered by physics. The question of contingency cannot be answered by physics because here the principle de nihilo nihil fit applies. The nihil in the sense of creation out of nothing is a metaphysical concept. It is not identical with what came closest to nothing in physics. Like the American astronomer, Carl Sagan, one uh, can understand the expanding universe going back to a Big Bang naturalistically as well as the evolution of life. At the beginning of his famous book on the universe, Sagan puts the following sentence, quote, the cosmos is all that is or ever was or ever will be, end of quote. Yet this is not a statement of physics, but a philosophical one, which formulates the worldview of a strong scientific naturalism. Likewise, the famous statement of Steven Weinberg Quote, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless, end of quote. This is a personal philosophical speculation that falls beyond the purview of science. In the natural sciences, the term pointless and senseless does not occur. It cannot be determined by any measurement and cannot be brought into any equation. In philosophy today, the Big Bang serves both as an argument for the belief that God does not exist, as well as an argument for the existence of God. According to Quentin Smith, God cannot be the creator of the Big Bang. Because the Big Bang, it contains no life. The almost infinite density, temperature, and curvature of the beginning is rather hostile to life. The natural laws, conditions of the earliest state of the universe are such that there is no guarantee for the emergence of life of a later time. William Lane Craig, on the other hand, connects the Big Bang with a cosmological argument for the existence of God. He calls his argument the Kalam argument because early Arabic Islamic theology developed the cosmological argument. If everything that begins to exist has a cause of its existence, then the universe, insofar as it has a beginning, must also have a cause of its existence. <clears throat> Neither the atheistic argument against nor the cosmological arguments for the existence of God are compelling neither in the recourse to the fine-tuning of the universe or the entropic principle connected with it. Even it is an argument for the possibility of finality in the universe. Modern physics neither refutes the existence of God nor gives the cosmological argument a higher probative force. But it is not contradictory to see the Big Bang 
and creatio ex nihilo as two sides of the same coin, even if we can never exactly determine what the Big Bang is based on. But this would be impossible if time, as it is known by man, that is the inner consciousness of time, the biographical memory and the time of history is not real. According to a philosophical interpretation of the theory of relativity and quantum physics, advocated at least by some physicists, not only is there no time common to the entire universe, but the time we experience as flowing time and time of the present, separating past and future, does not exist. This is the theory of the Bloch universe in space-time. Philosophers speak of eternalism. Shortly before his own death, Einstein wrote in a letter of condolence on the occasion of the death of his best friend, Michele Besso, quote, people like us who believe in physics know that the distinction of past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion, end of quote. While quantum physics knows only time quanta, and according to the general theory of relativity, there exists an equality of all points in space-time, the experience of a time continuum is constitutive for our conscious life. If time, as we experience it, was an illusion, our consciousness would consist of a brain that would make us believe that our conscious life was real. Arthur Stanley Eddington was convinced that there is time due to entropy in the universe. The second law of thermodynamics contains a time error because of entropy, time passes and flows. The increase in entropy accounts for the irreversibility of natural processes and the asymmetry between future and past. Perhaps also the physics of radioactive decay is, for, is a foundation for the distinction of past and future. Richard R. Muller, professor of physics at the University of Berkeley in California, believes that the time arrow does not have its foundation in entropy, but in the Big Bang singularity. As the explosion of a four-dimensional space-time, which is not only an expansion of space, but a dilation of time. Muller assumes a cosmological origin of time. The present is the moment created by the expansion of the four-dimensional space-time. The Italian physicist Carlo Rovelli, on the other hand, believed that an order of time in the physical universe exists only in the tiny and finite perspective of our consciousness and memory. A theology of creation makes a time theoretical understanding of the relationship between creatio, ex nihil, uh, creatio ex originalis and creatio continua necessary. If the creatio originalis conceived as creatio ex nihilo and the creatio continua rep represent the two sides of a divine creatio, and only appear to be successive in temporal perspective, then a temporal grounding of the divine creatio could be thought of via the concept of absolute presence. The one creation would then be the time-setting presence of the eternal God. Yet the creative activity of God cannot be seen as timeless because the eternity of God cannot be conceived without a comparison to the temporal differentiation of time unfolding itself in the universe. The last sheet. This would result in a transformation of Christian theism, which first would concern 
the overcoming of a traditional metaphysical concept of God's eternity. The eternity of God cannot be understood as a timeless eternity, but God's presence at all times. We have to introduce a dynamic element into our understanding of God's creative relation to the world. Either God is present in the universe everywhere or nowhere. Or, regardless, if, uh, excuse me, regardless the distinction between different modes of God's presence in his manifestation and revelation in history. Already Barth spoke of a temporality of the eternity in the life of God. With God, we are dealing with, quote, the fount and the sum and the source of all time, end of quote. The presence that God gives is our presence. Quote, his presence as such is the gift of my time, end of quote. It would be the task for another contribution to show what it means that according to St. John's prologue, everything was created by God's word. Thank you very much for your attention.